to celebrate the Abel Prize 2022, the Club of Mathematics, Isar Tiruvananthapuram, is hosting this year's Abel Prize talk in collaboration with Jain University, Bangalore, and Mathematical Sciences Institute, Belagavi. I would like to request Mr. Ramana Raju from Jain University to welcome our esteemed audience. Yeah. So, on behalf of all the three organizations participating in this initiative. of uh, discussing uh, on on the recently announced abel prize i welcome all the participants who have uh, registered uh, and also who are uh, in the respective uh, participating institutions namely the club of mathematics at iso tiruvananthapuram the jain university bangalore and the mathematical sciences institute belgavi so once again a hearty welcome to all i also welcome professor siddharth gadkil who is the who is the person who is going to deliberate on the works of uh, uh, of uh, dennis sullivan uh, who has recently got the uh, abel prize uh, for his uh, outstanding work in topology so over to you the uh, the iso tiruvanthapuram so thank you mr rajesh uh, the abel prize recognizes extraordinary contributions to the field of mathematics and is funded by the norwegian government the prize is awarded on the recommendations of the abel committee which consists of five internationally recognized mathematicians the abel prize is named after the norwegian mathematician niels henrik abel and is directly modeled after the nobel prizes the inaugural award was given in 2003 this time the norwegian academy of science and letters has awarded the abel prize for the year 2022 to american mathematician dennis sullivan the citation mentions that the award has been given for his ground breaking contributions to topology in its broadest sense and in particular its algebraic geometric and dynamical aspects we are glad to have among us professor siddharth gadkil from the indian institute of science bangalore to shed light on the mathematics of the 2022 awardee Professor Gadkil did his Bachelor of Statistics from Indian Statistical Institute, Calcutta, in 1995, and went on to do his PhD from the California Institute of Technology in 1999. He is now a professor in the Department of Mathematics, IIT Bangalore. Professor Gadkil's research interests are broadly in topology, and he has worked in multiple related areas, including geometric group theory, Riemannian geometry, and metric geometry, and his relation to probability theory. He has also briefly worked on applications of topology to molecular biology. I would like to extend my invitations to Professor Gadkil to commence his lecture. Some things I learned from Dennis Sullivan. Over to you, sir. Okay, thank you very much for uh, this invitation from both organizations. Uh, by coincidence, we I had Professor Venkatesh and Professor Raman Raju coming to my office and uh, uh, inviting me to give a talk on this occasion. And then either one or two days later, Sri Hari wrote to me on behalf of the Isaac Trivandrum students again asking for a lecture on the same thing. So I asked the two groups whether they would be happy enough in this, since it's anyway going to be from uh, remote. to have it uh, joined which they agreed with so thank you both of the uh, organizations so i'll be talking about some of the mathematics of uh, dennis sullivan now i have given this title some things i learned from dennis sullivan uh, largely because well okay for more than one reason but one of the things is that just around the time when i uh, when i heard that dennis sullivan won uh, the abel prize i mean i was very pleased i know him very well and i uh, wrote a blog some things i learned that's a short blog if you want i can share it later in the chat that blog was mainly meta mathematical things lessons about how to do mathematics that i have picked up from him uh, but also uh, i'm sorry uh, so now but uh, also of course the mathematics in brief so this talk will have much more uh, mathematics and it will have the same things of course that was just a, a short blog yeah uh, so <clears throat> and now i'm not going to it's not quite fair to say that my lecture is the mathematics of dennis sullivan he has done a huge amount of mathematics and i'm not an expert in most of it so it's some of the mathematics of dennis sullivan and some of the background and uh, some other things related to that that i have learned 
Okay. Uh, so the, do feel free to interrupt at any time. I'm not trying to rush. You may notice I have only 32 slides, even though the talk is going to be an hour and a half. So there's plenty of time. I will try to use the time to say things uh, in a leisurely way uh, with background and so on. Uh, so I'll begin with uh, the talk. <clears throat> okay, so here is Sullivan during his visit uh, to India. So I know Sullivan through three years I spent at Stony Brook where I was a postdoc. I used to attend his lectures. We had uh, conversations. Uh, Sullivan used to be in the audience of seminars, which is quite a phenomenal thing. Um, he also attended a course of mine one semester because he was uh, working on three manifold topology. I mean, he was, uh, which was not his original field, but was my original field. He was interested in that. And <clears throat> it's a wonderful experience being either way, listening to him with him as a fellow member in the audience and as a, uh, even with him in the audience when I'm speaking. The last can be a bit grueling because uh, he, he, well, I know first thing, before I first met him, there was a conference at Stony Brook on foliations that I didn't go to, but my fellow my student then, Tao Li, who's today a very successful mathematician, he came back from the conference and one of the things he said was he was almost shaking his head and said that during that conference, Dennis Sullivan was sitting in the front and he kept asking questions and he understood everything. I mean, that is a six day conference and Tao was sort of amazed at this phenomenon of mathematical talks when generally has uh, just assimilate something. But that this phenomenon of someone capable of understanding everything throughout a conference is very versatile and very uh, interesting uh, mathematician. So here is a photo of a uh, couple of photos during. So he may, has had two long visits to India. The first was in Chennai, IMSC Chennai, when he gave the original, uh, the first inaugural Nag Memorial Lecture. So he came for that lecture and was there a few more days giving other lectures and uh, my colleague Harish was here. I don't know if he's in the audience. Anyway, his photo is here. And I we went to uh, Chennai and we were there in the IMSC guest house and we were talking to Sullivan and uh, so many things I say from that. And his second visit was in IISC where he gave the centenary lecture. My last slide will be on the topic of his centenary lecture. So that is the, I mean, that's not the only time he has spoken about it. He has spoken about that many times. And here you see him with a lot of students. Uh, so socially that is uh, not uncommon, but I'll have more to say. So this is uh, Shoma, Dheeraj, Divakaran, Sushil, uh, Atrey, and uh, oh, Shoma is again. Uh, myself and Harish are here. And this is Moira Chats, his wife, who's a uh, co-author of myself, as well as one, I don't know if Arpan is in the audience here, Arpan Kabiraj, who's now at, who was my former student. He's now at IIT Palakkad. He's also a co-author of Moira <coughs> on string topology, which is, I mean, related, Goldman bracket, related to string topology, which is a creation of Sullivan and uh, Moira Chats. So it's not just that we went for tours, that's not common, but Sullivan had, as he put it, seven separate conversations conversations going. Well, seven is approximate, but with all these students, he had some mathematical conversation going, besides with me, with Harish, probably with Gautam, other faculty members. I don't know how many he had going. And his general style of doing mathematics was, I mean, if you have seen, for those who have seen ISC, there is, uh, as you enter the maths department, there's an open area with a platform, a blackboard, a table, and some chairs. At that time, it was fully open. Since then, it's sort of transparently enclosed because of mosquitoes, but be that as it may. So he used to settle down there. And in fact, once when I went to meet him uh, to the office, the normal conventional office that uh, Moira and Dennis shared in uh, our department, Moira said, Dennis is in his office. By that, she meant this particular room downstairs uh, that had become Dennis's office. He would settle there, and if any of seven, eight of us passed by, he would wave us and start discussing mathematics. So that's, that's his style. In that way, he has been very inspiring to generations of mathematicians. Of course, here it's with us, with our students uh, and uh, many others. And uh, but in another phase of its life in IHES, when he was talking, he used to be at the center of conversations. Those were with people like Deline and Alan Kohn and Bourguet and Gromov. I mean, these were the uh, people at that uh, level. And so many things one learns from him, one learns indirectly also from uh, these people. Yeah. So let me sort of say what. Uh, oh, 
Okay, so and I was for some comments that Sullivan had made before I get to the mathematics proper. So this was a comment he made in a mathematical discussion during his course. I mean, why be clever when we can be intelligent? And then while preparing for this talk, I saw something similar with this view that he uh, uh, is in writing. So that's what I've quoted. So the point is that, well, you solve something by being clever means you solved it, you found an answer, you established that's the answer, but being intelligent means you actually know why that is the answer. So this is quoted from Sullivan's famous paper, which was the climax of his work in high dimensional topology uh, called genetics of homotopy theory and Adam's conjecture. And he says the fact that certain complicated expression in exterior powers of vector bundles give good operations in K-theory is more a testament to Adam's ingenuity, which is cleverness, than to the ultimate naturality of this viewpoint. So a lot of Sullivan's paper meant was really focused on uh, uh, the... <clears throat> that particular paper and his work on trying to understand why, what is the real natural view of looking at certain things and that made certain things more or less evident. Now this is of course one way, I, uh, the thing about mathematics is if you take one thing as the only correct you are going to be stymied by it. So it's not that don't be clever, sometimes the best thing is to be clever but if you have the choice of being intelligent you can. I mean, this is a growth indic philosophy. In fact, Sullivan has commented that in the 70s, they were all operating in the growth indic mode, that a mathematical problem, if you look at it the right way, it should become trivial. This is not, of course, true always. There are problems which are fundamentally elementary, but you need to be clever and so on, but it's important. A second thing which has sort of influenced me greatly, and I know when I shared these with people, colleague also said this was a very, uh, you know, he, that was his favorite uh, insight here. So this is something I'd been working on and I gave a talk on this, which was a combinatorial description of uh, triangulation, compactification of a triangulation of moduli space and, and Sullivan liked it a, a lot and so on. But at the end of it, he said, you should give me a description so, which will fit on two sides of a sheet of paper. So it takes a sheet of paper and says it, it should fit on two sides of a sheet of paper. So then I rewrote things starting with a description on two sides and everything else was an expansion of that. And that vastly improved not only the writing but understanding as well. So this was a, a certain thing. Okay, a third uh, quotation here is, uh, which is uh, try to prove with the things without hypothesis. This I remember. I'll come to the specific thing actually a little later where he contexts this. This was that oh, it was a conversation at dinner time, in fact, with Harish and myself in IMSC Chennai during his first visit there. And he was mentioning a result. So in mathematics, for example, the Poincare conjecture, which was in my graduate students' days and so on until Perelman's work, and going back way back in time, a very central problem in topology. And a lot of the difficulty of the Poincare conjecture was that it was a statement that said that if a three manifold is simply connected, then it is a sphere. And how do you use the fact that it's simply connected? Uh, your method should break down if it is not simply connected. In fact, many wrong proofs of the Poincare conjecture actually use only that it's a homology sphere. Yeah. So, uh, uh, so this is a key point. And conversely, if you suddenly see something with a very difficult to use hypothesis, which is a breakthrough, uh, then you should try to understand how the hypothesis was used, and that would be important. Okay. Uh, so these are some of the broad principles that I used. As I said, my blog, I have expanded on these a little bit. Uh, another comment he made when con context of mathematics as contrasted with natural sciences is that we feel that there's just too much technique in mathematics and not enough to do with those techniques, that we are too focused on techniques. Okay, this was maybe a more controversial kind of thing, so I won't elaborate uh, on this. Okay, I will instead turn uh, to his mathematics and the background for his mathematics. Yeah, so Sullivan was an extremely broad, versatile mathematician. He started in high dimensional topology. Siddharth, yeah. can, can you please give a reference to your blog because you're mentioning some- Yes, sure, I'll put it in the chat. Can I put it in the chat in the sure. break? Sure, sure, sure. Okay, so when, uh, because right now it will mean double screen. Yeah, remind me in the break or just after the break if I haven't. So between the first half and the second half of my uh, lecture, I'll put a web link to that blog. Yeah, but the blog is much shorter than this. So uh, 
most things there I will say in greater detail here, at least the mathematics. But yes, thanks for this. I was going to say this uh, uh, anyway. So thanks, Raman, for uh, reminding me to do that. Yeah. Uh, so Sullivan's uh, work spans a lot. So he's a very versatile mathematician. He's starting with high dimensional topology. So topology of high dimensional manifolds. Now, while there was work of Tom and so on about uh, which was important related to this, in some sense, this field you can say took off with the work of Milner, and uh, Milner was in um, in the 1950s, late 50s, 56, 57, with his discovery of exotic spheres, spheres that are uh, topologically but not smoothly standard. I'll say what these are, and you can, in some sense, high-dimensional topology reached the peak with the work of Sullivan on genetics of homotopy theory, as, I, as he calls it. This was in the early 70s. Now, this is a field that I know something about. But after that, it's not that the field was dead. But it was a field where, uh, um, but in some sense, the most important progress was over. And there has been important work by Farrell Jones. There are still conject questions like the Borel conjecture that remain in the field. But a sign of the field uh, losing its uh, uh, sort of dynamism or reducing its dynamism was both these people I mentioned, Milner and Sullivan, left the field around the mid 70s. Yeah, so both moved, in fact, to dynamics. And mm -hmm. in, in fact, both of them are at Stony Brook. They are 10 years apart. So Stony Brook, every 10 years, has uh, almost back to back the Milner's uh, say 70th and Sullivan's 60th birthday, etc. So, yeah. So they are. Uh, so, he, so Sullivan moved on to complex dynamics, where he has his uh, very famous work, uh, more than one, but I will mention one: the no wandering domain theorem. The bridge between these two was Kleinian groups. Kleinian groups are something that were born in complex analysis. They involve complex analysis and topology. Uh, their huge role in topology has a lot to do with the work of Thurston. But Sullivan was an early champion of Thurston's work and has proved many of the important results that went into this bridge. And as I will mention, his work in dynamics and Kleinian groups was very closely related. He has worked on differential geometry, uh, string topology, and uh, more recently, algebraic topology and fluid mechanics. Now, this more recently is in a weak sense because uh, the first time I heard him talk about this was in MSRI Berkeley in the 1990s uh, at a lecture where actually I understood nothing at all. He has spoken about it at the centenary lecture and he has an article about it in uh, Journal of Differential Geometry and so on. I'll come to that right at the end. Okay, so it has also been at the center of many things via just understanding exposition, seminars, etc. This was the IHES French style partly. So he used to have the seminar in CUNY. It was quite a phenomenal thing. I've been to three of them perhaps, uh, Garu Viterbo, Garu Philades, and uh, uh, Sasha Giventhal. So they would start with an informal background seminar at maybe 12.30, 12.45 and go on till two. Then you had a first break, then you had a formal seminar, which was one hour, then a break. And then it went on from 4.15 or something to 7.30, 8, 8, 39, depending on when the stamina ran out. It was quite phenomenal. And I still remember more than 20 years, about 20 years, just over 20 years ago. Still remember the talks because uh, it's quite an experience. But also quite importantly, when Thurston's work came along, uh, Sullivan was the one who really understood it first. And because they had decided that he's the one person who can understand it fully, uh, they both went off to University of Colorado at Boulder. This is in the Rocky Mountains. And they spent a year there. And they had their individual projects. But the main goal of that uh, time was that Sullivan would fully understand Thurston's proof. When he came back, he spoke at an AMS event and gave a seminar at Budbaki lecture in Paris and wrote an article correspondingly, which was a sort of first exposition of these things. And that thing I said on two sheets of paper, I saw in writing, he wanted to write a summary of Thurston argument on two sheets of paper, geometrization conjecture. Uh, so yeah, so now let me get to his mathematics proper. And I will give a sort of general, uh, the general uh, meta rule here is that I'm going to go up and down. Okay, so on the one hand, 
I don't, you'll be from widely varying backgrounds. Some people may not be very familiar with topology and so on. So I will say, uh, or you may know topology in the set topology sense. So I will try to say something for that. But at the same time, to convey some of the deeper aspects, I will uh, say things which will not be understandable to those without background. So I'm saying this in advance because usually maths talks start somewhere and climb up. This will keep climbing up and down. So in case something becomes ununderstandable, uh, just sort of assimilate it for, uh, just listen to it as a kind of assimilate uh, what is going on in some weak sense. And soon enough, I'll move to another topic and get back to basics. So if, if you get lost, it doesn't mean you're lost from then onwards. This was the meta rule. Okay, so let me start with something basic, a Riemann mapping theorem. And I'm starting with this for a particular reason. And uh, so the Riemann mapping tells you that if you have any domain in the plane without holes, such as uh, this kidney shaped swimming pool and then I take a domain in the plane which is a circle uh, which okay then there is a complex analytic function which will take this to this f and f of z is going to be something like a constant plus uh, so let's call it a0 plus a1z plus a to z squared plus etc. So there's a nice function, actual power series, which will take these points to these points. Okay. So I started with this because this is what started Sullivan in mathematics. I mean, this he had said in actually, he had stated the Riemann uniformization in one lecture uh, and then said, this is what got him into mathematics because he said, till then what you had seen in mathematics was uh, formulas and calculations and so on. So he started off as a chemical engineer. He was in Texas and he went to Rice University, which was the local very good university. He was in Houston, Texas. And uh, so he was, so you had to take maths courses as an engineer. And suddenly when he saw that you could have uh, such a formula or in fact described in a slightly different way, which I will say, and this is essentially unique. I'll say what essentially unique means because it's important later, but there's an essentially unique way to map this complex analytically. He was suddenly struck by this suddenly being much deeper. This is not like the simple maths. And then he struck, it's, it, he thought that mathematics has something really uh, deep in it. And uh, he'll start studying. He's one of the most natural born mathematicians I've seen. Uh, so he started with, so this got him into uh, uh, mathematics. And many, many years later, an extension of this played a role in his, uh, in a very important, in some very important work of his. So let me just say what it means by essentially unique briefly. If you add three points on the boundary here, and three points on the boundary, and let's label them A, B, and C, and send these to three points A, B, and C corresponding points. Okay, let's call them A prime, B prime, and C prime. And I want to send A to A prime, and B to B prime, and C to C prime. Then it actually becomes unique, this map. Not just essentially unique, but actually unique. So a fourth point will not go to the fourth point if you specify it. Okay, this will become important uh, later on when I'm uh, in a minute when I'm talking about this. Okay, so now the importance of Riemann mapping and many of the uh, also motivating some other things that I'm just going to say is that in dimension two, all sorts of notions coincide. Okay, they, this is both use, I mean, this is important in many respects. <clears throat> One, so, oh, there's a typo there, it's complex analytic. So complex analytic is given by complex power series, as I said. Holomorphic is differentiable in one complex variable. And conformal is what preserves angles infinitesimally. What I mean by that is if I have a function from something here to something here, which I have f, and I take a point, and I send it to a point here, and the function is smooth, then a general smooth function, okay, uh, let's look at its image on a, or yellow wouldn't be visible, uh, on a circle here, which I pretend is infinitesimal. 
Okay, so then if it's a smooth function, it can do two things. It can change the size and it can also distort. So a circle by linear map goes to an ellipse. Okay, but uh, the minor axis and so, with, so you have a minor axis and major axis, they may become different from each other. Now, conformal map is one which preserves angles. So it sends circles to circles, maybe bigger circles. Okay, so angles are preserved, but lengths need not be preserved. So this, so the nice thing about this is that sometimes one of these conditions comes about due to nature, like in uh, the schramm lovner equation, for example, in probability theory. So something for a geometric reason becomes conformal, and then you can use all the power of it being complex analytic or vice versa. So all these notions coinciding means some things that come from here can be used there. But it also means that when you generalize, one should be aware of this and that subjects diverge when you go to higher dimensions. This will be related to the next slide. So the Riemann mapping theorem can be described as saying there's a unique way um, fixing three points on the boundary in a way which preserves angles. So that's a geometrically really nice way of uh, describing it. So they're also closely related to harmonic functions, which satisfy Laplacian is zero, or the mean value property, which means that the average, uh, sorry, I've lost my cursor. So it means that if I have a point and I look at a circle around it, unit circle, and I, I have a function and I look at f of z naught and I look at f of z for all points on the circle. If I average them, I'll get f of z naught. So the real part of complex functions are harmonic functions as are their imaginary parts and these are closely related. This is also invariant under Brownian motion. Okay. So with that, I'll get to a very important result of Sullivan. Not as famous as uh, maybe the others, but very important in as well. Okay, not as famous as simply because he has done so many important things. It would be more famous than a result that uh, most people have proved. So this was actually independently proved about the same time by Mike Anderson, who's also now at Stony Brook. He's, I don't know if Harish is here. So he's Harish's advisor, which makes him also the uh, mathematical grandfather of many people around here, Mike Anderson, that is. So De Mike Anderson was then a young uh, mathematician who did this with a much more analytical way. And uh, so, well, Sullivan did it following this picture. So this I'll explain. In fact, Sullivan commented that there was one single fact, which I'll state in a moment. And a lot of his research for many years was just based on this single fact, I mean, research about this matter. So I have mentioned harmonic functions. Again, for, uh, for a moment, I will assume people know that. So if you know the value of a harmonic function on the boundary of a circle, this is a disk and I have a boundary of a disk. And if I know the value of a harmonic function, then I can determine its value on the interior by Poisson integral formula. But this is a very explicit formula. It depends on it being exactly a disk, et cetera, et cetera. But what about if you do not have uh, something this precise, instead you just have negative curvature. Now, for those who don't know negative curvature, it means it's like a tree, geometrically like a tree. Okay. So as I said, harmonic functions satisfy mean value property. And so if you think of functions on the vertices of a tree, if I think of functions on the vertices of a tree, so this is a vertex, it's adjacent vertex, vertices are these three. So you can define a harmonic function on a tree as a function on the vertices so that the value here is the average of these three. And the single fact Sullivan used is that if you're on a tree and let's say this is the origin and you're at that black point, then there are two ways you can go away from the origin and only one way you can go towards the origin. So if you travel randomly, there's a two third chance you're going away from the origin and only one third chance that you're moving towards the origin. And this balance, uh, this fact that so hence you're likely to drift further and further away from the origin. And this will mean, so you can use the random walk and get the result that if you are given a function on the boundary of a negatively curved manifold, this is the bound negatively curved manifolds have a natural boundary associated to that. And in fact, it need not even be continuous an L infinity function. You have a harmonic function, bounded harmonic function corresponding to that. So Liouville's theorem will tell you that you don't have bounded harmonic functions on the whole complex plane. So you, so similarly on Euclidean plane, you don't have them. 
So bounded other than the constants, but you have a lot of bounded harmonic functions in negative curvature as proved by Anderson and Sullivan. He proved a bunch of results using this. Okay, so this is, is one important result of his in uh, differential geometry. Okay, which is related to uh, harmonic functions. And uh, okay, so here is a non result of Sullivan. I'm stating this because of what I quoted. Okay, so Sullivan, Thurston made a conjecture that every three manifold is geometric, except that that conjecture was much more complicated than that. It said that if you take a three manifold, you can decompose it along spheres, along tori in a unique way. This was known before Thurston. And that once you decompose, every remaining piece is geometric. So if it's aspherical and atoroidal, then it becomes geometric. Okay. And so here the issue came that it is difficult to prove because you have to prove that it's asphere. You have to use that it's aspherical and atoroidal in proving geometrization. And indeed in Anderson's approach, uh, as he himself said, uh, Anderson, I mentioned in another context more towards geometrization. The difficulty was so there were many approaches, topological, differential geometric, etc., to proving geometrization. And uh, so the difficulty was often that you just don't know how to use aspherical. So you have an approach, you use a Yamabe invariant, this, that, you find a minimax, but you know this should break down if it's aspherical. So conversely, if it breaks down, you have to identify an essential sphere. And that essential sphere becomes hard. So hypothesis becomes hard to use. And in some sense, Perelman nicely bypassed this, at least in the case of aspherical. Okay. Uh, so this became relevant. But Sullivan and Thurston had conjectured that maybe every three manifold has a conformally flat metric. And this implies geometrization. That's not trivial, but it was known by that time and not incredibly hard, not anywhere near as hard as the actual proof of geometrization that we know today. Okay, And so this is what Sullivan was commenting about. And he said that it would be, uh, so it's always good to prove things without hypothesis. He was mentioning that he and Seth Huston were discussing this because it was, uh, it would be nice if it was true, you could try to prove this without hypothesis and then get the corollary. Actually, it turned out that uh, this was false. And uh, Goldman, whom I recently read, was then an undergraduate, actually, some years later. So this is William Goldman. Many of you know his work. The Goldman Bracket, who which is his work, which Moira and I have collaborated on and which was the inspiration for the string topology of Sullivan and Moira. So uh, his uh, Goldman, some years later, showed that this is actually false. So it's good to prove a more general statement about hypothesis, but of course, you have to be convinced, I mean, the statement has to be true. Otherwise, there's simply no way you're going to prove it. Okay, so that is the, uh, yeah. Sorry. Okay, so now I will turn to uh, the Riemann mapping again. So Alfors and Bears proved the measurable Riemann mapping theorem. And Sullivan in all his Abel interviews is saying that he was very pleased that Riemann mapping brought him into mathematics and he used an extension of Riemann mapping in proving one famous result of his. Not his result in high dimensional topology, which is a bit, uh, uh, which is other set of famous, most famous results. Okay, so as I said, differential geometry, Kleinian groups, foliations, he has famous results in lots of things, but two most, two peaks in some sense, so one of them came out of this. Okay, so let me just give some background here. So I conformally equivalent is complex analytically equivalent, which means you can map one to the other where you're allowed to distort distances, but not angles. So this means preserving angles. Okay, so here are some pictures. If I take a short and fat cylinder, okay, and then I take a long and thin one. Well, I could also take a short and well, not so short and not and fatter cylinder. So suppose uh, this was, suppose this was, uh, well, this that, that doesn't look real, realistic. So let me call this H and let's call this W. Suppose this was actually, uh, the height was twice that and the width was twice W. Then these two are conformally equivalent because you can just scale. Yeah, so preserve angle. So this is conformally equivalent. So if you scale things up, 
take Euclidean cylinders, you can preserve angles and uh, you will end up with the, these two being equal. But if you try to distort height and width, then the angles are not preserved, right? So if I took a circle here, it will become tall thin ellipse if I try to match this. Maybe this is width by, I don't know, five or something. And this is height by, uh, the, sorry, twice the height. Maybe this is three times the height, something like that. So if you take the obvious map between this and this, it is not conformal. That, of course, does not show they're not conformally equivalent. There's a beautiful Alfors extremal length argument, which actually shows that they're not uh, conformally equivalent. I'm sorry about this. Uh, this app I'm using, Zernal, has a tendency to crash sometimes. That was to avoid that happening. Mm, so uh, there was a, so. of course, that doesn't prove they're not conformally equivalent, but it's true they're not conformally equivalent. But what is true is that any annulus is conformally equivalent to a right circular cylinder. So if I took any cylinder, maybe a wibbly wobbly one like this, okay, with a weird notion of distance, then I can conformally deform it to some right circular cylinder. And hence also bigger or smaller, but height over width cannot be changed. This becomes conformal invariant, okay? So this is a this is called a modulus of an annulus. It's a complete conformal invariant of the annulus. So here they're not going to be self-contained. Uh, importantly, the same holds for rectangles, which are really just discs with four marked points. Remember, I said three marked points are sent to three other marked points. But if I take four marked points A, B, C, D. And I take four marked points here, A prime, B prime, C prime, D prime. As I said, I, you can, Riemann mapping tells you that you can take the disk to the disk and you can send A to A, A, B to B and C to C prime. But this will generally not send D to D prime. In fact, it being a, a unique means D will either go to D prime or not and you're stuck. So whether D goes to D prime or not is determined by the modulus again, which is again the height over width. So these also have a height and a width. These also have a height over width. Again, it's a confirm complete invariant for rectangles. Rectangles and annuli are very similar. You just glue one and you will get the other. This happens for the same reason. Okay, so at this point, I'll uh, assume a little more background. So homeomorphism, quite remarkably, these notions of conformality, so far I've been assuming things are smooth and talking about derivatives and so on. You just have to work with continuous functions. Homeomorphism means continuous bijection, whose inverse is also continuous. So, so continuous bijection, uh, bicontinuous bijection. So you define it to be k-conformal, k-quasi-conformal, if moduli of rectangles are distorted by a bounded amount k. Okay, so that means if I take any rectangle, so I have F which maps this region to another region. I can take this rectangle, I can take this rectangle. They are mapped to two other rectangles here. If I look at the modulus of this and the modulus of this, or the modulus of this and modulus of this, they may not be equal, but they vary by at most a factor of two, by bounded amount. So you say it's K quasi conformal if you have a control over the distortion of moduli of rectangles. It just needs continuity to define this. It does not need any kind of smoothness. Okay. Very remarkably, one of the beautiful results in Alfors based theory is that if it's one quasi conformal, that is to say, if moduli of rectangles are preserved, then it is actually conformal, which means it's smooth and it's holomorphic. I find this quite amazing that it's just continuous and you have this coarse control and you will find that they're actually conformal. You get a power series representation, infinitely differentiable everything from just saying rectangle moduli are not distorted. It's even more magical than what you'll see in basic complex analysis. But the important point here is that they satisfy, so these satisfy what's called a Beltrami equation, which is del Z bar derivative versus, oops, typo. <laughs> okay. So Z derivative, so this is del Z. So if I look at the derivative in Z bar direction, and uh, I also got my del's wrong. <laughs> so del, so partial derivative with respect to Z bar is smaller than the partial derivative to Z, and you have a control over this. 
Okay, so this is the uh, belt. So if you are quasi conformal, in a weak sense, you have this kind of derivative. But measurable Riemann mapping tells you the converse. Yeah. Yeah. That uh, you seem to be using modulus or uh, I mean uh, norm of mu z. Is it is it some norm being defined or? Ha, huh, sup norm. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thanks. So thanks. Uh, so sorry. This is just the supremum of the modulus. Thanks for that question. So this is supremum of mod of mu of z. Yeah. Okay. So uh, so to so to say this again, if Quasi-conformal map distorts moduli of annuli by bounded amount. If it's one quasi-conformal, we know it's smooth and so on, but not in general for case k quasi-conformal. So derivatives need not exist everywhere. They exist only almost everywhere. So mu is going to also be in L infinity, but we can write an equation that it satisfies. And measurable Riemann mapping theorem tells you that given the mu, you get a quasi-conformal map corresponding to that. Okay. And very importantly, the conformal structures, the different annuli, for example, can be parametrized using mu up to its appropriate equivalence. This involves a clever idea, bears uh, and non-trivial theorems. There's the bears simultaneous uniformization. I won't get into this, but let me, for those who don't know, but let me just say measurable Riemann mapping theorem exists. It says that we can parametrize quasi-conformal mappings. Okay, and with that, let me state an important uh, result the no wandering domains theorem of Sullivan. <clears throat> so suppose we have a rational function f. So a rational function is just a ratio of two polynomials p of z by q of z. And so this is going to be a zero plus a one z plus whatever plus a n z to the n divided by so and so. Suppose we have a rational function. This is a very naturally important class of functions from the complex plane union infinity to itself. This dynamics was very well, has been, is very well studied. Uh, the study of it began with the work of Julia and Fatou who de defined the Julia set and Fatou set. They have independent definitions, but they turn out to be the complements of each other. Okay. This was work from the 1920s. So the Fatu set is the set on which these open sets here on which the dynamics is nice. And the Julia set is the set on which it's horrible. It's chaotic. Okay, so the precise definitions which tell you that this picture is the from Wikimedia Commons due to Lasse Rempe, who was a student of Milner actually when I was at Stony Brook. Uh, so uh, these parameters are chosen to make the picture nice. So this is... Uh, uh, so here are the Fatu domains, and this is the Julia set, and the dynamics acts on this. And what it does, it takes Fatu domains to Fatu domains. Now, if a Fatu domain is fixed, then it's, uh, sorry, uh, I'll come to that. So if it's fixed, then we can understand the dynamics on the Fatu domain. Because as I said, it's, it's nice, and if it's fixed, then we can understand the dynamics on this Fatu domain. But Fatu and Julia did various things about it, but one thing they could not prove, and this was an open question since then, which is a very basic one. So suppose we take such a rational function, then the Fatu components are taken to other Fatu components. So dynamics acts on this. And there are fundamentally two possibilities, one of which is that u, f of u, f squared of u can all be distinct from each other. And then things are out of control. All you know is that this is taken to this is taken to this. But the other possibility is that it could be eventually periodic, which means if I look at u, f of u, f squared of u, etc., finally some fn will be, say, f squared. It need not be the original one. It's quasi-periodic. That is, u goes to some. So what we could have is, uh, let me draw it. So I could have this guy going to this guy. Now, these are just the sets. This guy could go here, go here, go here, go here, and then this guy may come back. Once it happens, it keeps going in a loop. And this means some power is periodic, is a fixes of a two domain, so we can understand it. So a very basic understanding had a barrier here. And the barrier was we did not know if this always happens. You could have a wandering domain. And so in, a 19, in 1985, Sullivan proved the famous result that you never have a wandering domain. This gives a very nice structure theorem for, uh, for the functions, completing the work of Fatu and Julia from many decades earlier, 60 years earlier. Uh, it's an obviously important statement about this. 
So the interesting thing is how did Sullivan prove this? Well, I mean, many interesting things. An interesting aspect of this is how did uh, Sullivan prove this? Well, he had been working on Kleinian groups and he had been Sita? working on... Uh... Yeah, go ahead. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm just sorry to interrupt you. Okay. No, no problem. Is, is, is this something to do with the Mandelbrot sets which are... Uh... Uh, yes, yes. So Mandelbrot set is very closely related to this. I won't try to define it here, not being a complex uh, analysis expert. So the Mandelbrot set is the set of parameters of these. So if we are looking at quadratic functions, the set of parameters, so you look at the set of parameters of these and you look at where Julia sets and Fatu sets have certain properties and that defines the Mandelbrot set. Is, is, is that the same status that uh, they are uh, hard to compute? Is it uh, still an open problem? Yeah, yeah. The very important problem about local connectivity of Mandelbrot set was not answered by no wandering domains and is still an open problem. Okay. okay. So, the, so that is a problem about all dynamical systems. This is a problem about every specific dynamical system. Clearly, the every specific dynamical system problems have to be answered before you answer all. And this is a very, maybe the most basic question about every, after Fatu and Julia's work, about every specific dynamical system. And this is uh, for, so we understand every specific one, but the space of all of them, the important question on Mandelbrot set remains. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So to come back to the Sullivan's uh, result. Yeah. So the sequence so the proof so sullivan had been working on what are called kleinian groups where there was a basic question of alfors i mentioned alfors bears work and so on alfors and bears were the leaders in building this field along with pack muller and a few others uh, so he had been working on a problem of alfors and he did not succeed in solving that but he had noticed that there is a dictionary between kleinian groups and uh, and uh, complex dynamics and ideas from one correspond to ideas from the other. And as he described it, he had worked hard for eight months without success on this Alforsus theorem. And then Yokos in a talk, Yokos is a very well known person in dynamics. He has a Fields medal and so on, mentioned this question. And so then 15 days later, Sullivan had a solution. And the point is he just transferred all he had learned from Alpha for the Alfors finiteness question to dynamics and that was enough to answer this question. It wasn't enough to answer the original Alfos thing, but the understanding he had built up. Okay, so the measurable Riemann mapping theorem and its parameterizations played a role in this and beyond this in some Feigenbaum universality properties that he had done. Okay, so with this we come to topology. Uh, I started a couple of minutes early. So what I'll do is I'll, uh, it's a very nice transition point. I will briefly say a few things about topology and maybe in the second half, I will rapidly repeat them and take off from uh, there. Okay. So Sullivan's work was really in topology. And uh, since that's my field, though not high dimensional topology, I'll step back and give a sort of bird's eye view of the field. Okay. So what is topology? Okay. So for those who are, uh, many of you would have seen it. The key point of the topology was topology was born while studying more concrete objects. A lot of mathematics is born while studying concrete objects by abstracting properties of them, not starting with the abstract object. And Riemann, while studying equations, uh, understood that in some fun, I mean, surface is given by equations, the kind of things you study in coordinate geometry, understood that in some fundamental sense, the sphere and the ellipsoid are equal to each other but they are different from the torus. Okay. And topology is born with this notion. The notion is that sphere can be continuously deformed or continuously transformed. These are somewhat different, but related notions. Okay. So if you look at properties that, uh, to each other, but not to this. And so when you're trying to understand um, hyperboloids and paraboloids, but more generally uh, equation, uh, uh, geometric objects given by equations in the correct way, there is this more fundamental notion of being different. And then there's, there's the more uh, less, more refined notion of being different. So the more fundamental notion is what is topology is the study of properties unchanged by continuous transformations. And these are generally turn out to be global properties. Global in two senses here. Global in one sense is that you have uh, 
a little piece of this they don't depend on little pieces of the torus sphere and ellipsoid all look like each other it is when you go globally that they look different from each other so globally with respect to one space but also globally with respect to all spaces N namely if you are looking at uh, as i said equations given by polynomials they are also locally like each other in a sense but they deform in parameters okay so if you go from one to the other you can continuously go from one to the other and so in that sense they are globally the uh, so global in two senses global at the level of a single space and global at the level of families of space so topology is the study of properties which are global as it turns out formally it's the study of properties that are unchanged by continuous transformations and the basic way in which you start studying topology is to construct invariants things that are not changed when a space is continuously transformed into the other and these are rooted in the first theorem in topology actually goes back to euler in a sense so if you look at vertices minus edges plus faces this is two for a convex polyhedron okay this is uh, uh, in fact taught in ninth standard in cbsc i know uh, right now is uh, my daughter so i learned it in school recently so if i look at a tetrahedron or i look at a cube and the number of vertices edges faces all change but this quantity remains the same so this is an invariant but if you take a torus for example so the thing is that these are all secretly spheres their surfaces are spheres if i take a torus and break it up into triangles which i am not going to do here then v minus e plus f will be zero and however you break it up into triangles squares anything it will always be zero and if you took this surface you would always get minus 2 okay so these invariants will tell you that these two are topologically different because if two things are topologically the same this quantity remains the same but these you can just calculate and see that these quantities are different in the case of uh, topological uh, this uh, uh, sphere and these so these are things that rooted it out okay so uh, well so in some sense you have two contrasting things in uh, topology algebraic and geometric topology okay in algebraic topology we algebraically construct invariants and in geometric topology we work towards the converse okay 